Let's pray together. We're going to jump into 1 Peter chapter 3. If you're new with us, we usually work through books of the Bible. We're going to start the Gospel of John in a few weeks, but taking a few weeks to talk about one aspect of our mission, namely making the Gospel known to the world. Um, and so let's pray together and we'll continue that discussion. Father, we uh, come to you now thanking you for your word. Come to you now recognizing that we need your Holy Spirit more than we need air to breathe. We need your word more than we need food to eat. We need your gospel more than we need this earth to stand on. And so we pray that you would come and hear our need of you and attend to our cry. We're mindful of your word where it says that unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. So I pray today you would use this sermon as a means by which we put to death things in our life that shouldn't be present, that we may bear fruit and so prove to be your disciples. So we pray you would come and attend to these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I tried to be really practical as we looked at Colossians chapter 4 and we talked about network evangelism and I shared an acronym with you, N, uh, never stop praying, E, exercise your faith wisely, and T, talk graciously, um, talk uh, uh, wisely and talk appropriately. And we uh, talked about our networks. I gave you a little network card to be thinking about those in your geographical network, commercial networks, familial networks, recreational networks, uh, in order that we may live more intentionally when it comes to evangelism. If last week was about the how of evangelism, this week is about the heart of evangelism. And this is ultimately where the problem lies in our hearts. Some believers don't lack preparation and training. I mean, some of us have been schooled on everything. We've had courses on evangelism, read books on evangelism, memorized presentations. Some have even learned how to work the famous Evangicube, and yet we're still not witnessing. Why? Well, it's a matter of the heart. When a young lady gets engaged, it's amazing how her conversation and her lifestyle changes. She shows off that ring. She shows pictures of her fiancé. She updates her Facebook status. She begins planning that wedding. She begins to plan on how to fit in that dress for that wedding. And why? Well, she, she's got a new love. You don't have to tell her, hey, will you come and tell us about Mr. Wright? She doesn't need force. She doesn't need to be guilted into talking about him. She wants to. I mean, Kimberly practically drove her family crazy talking about me after we were engaged, as I remember it. Um, you see, when it comes to evangelism, guilt won't ultimately motivate us, not in a sustained sense if we just come and try to guilt you into sharing the gospel. What motivates a Christian is beauty, hope, Love, awe, all of which are right here in First Peter. You see, we talk about that which we treasure, that which we love, that which we revere, that which we hope in. Those are the things that we, we talk about. And you'll notice in this text here, this, this kind of dual focus on the external circumstances of Peter's day and the internal uh, nature of their hearts that Peter is addressing. He tells them to set apart Christ the Lord as holy in their hearts. And that is what will transcend the, the various challenges that are, is around them in the culture. He tells them to, to give a reason for the hope that is within them, you see. It's out of the overflow of the heart that we bear witness to Jesus. Now, this is not the only time Peter's talked about the heart. He's over in chapter 1 talked about the community of faith, and he says that we should love one another from a pure heart. In chapter 3, he was talking to believing wives who are married to unbelieving husbands. And he says to the ladies in that passage that their adorning should not be external, but internal. The hidden person of the heart, he says. You see, we begin the Christian life in the heart and we continue it through the heart, don't we? If you're not a Christian, you can hear Romans 10, 9 and think about these things. As Paul says, if... if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. This is how we begin. 
But we continue through the heart. As Jesus says in John chapter 7, that whoever believes in me out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, when you love Jesus deeply, it changes your behavior dramatically. When you love Jesus deeply, it changes your conversations dramatically. You're going to share the hope within you, even if there are challenges all around you. The internal must surpass the external challenges. Tom Schreiner says this regarding this passage. He says, the inner and outer life are inseparable. For what happens within will inevitably be displayed to all, especially when one suffers. And that's the context in which Peter is writing, a context of suffering. And he's saying what has to happen is there must be a hope that is within you that will transcend all of these challenges and all of the opposition that is around you. Now, what were the challenges that Peter's audience were facing? And what are the challenges that you and I are facing in our context? It's important that we think about these challenges so that we then may probe our hearts and speak out of a, an overflow of, of love and adoration of Jesus, or otherwise we, we won't do it. We'll cave into the pressure, the external pressures around us. Okay, so Peter's context, I would just simply uh, summarize it as a hostility to the gospel. You can just do a cursory reading of 1 Peter, and it's very clear that these Christians were facing persecution, mistreatment, slander, and marginalization. Peter is writing to Christians who are scattered across Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. He's writing from Rome. He's writing when Nero was the emperor, the one tradition tells us put Peter himself to death. You may have heard the phrase before, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Nero set a fire to Rome, blamed it on the Christians, and consequently many of them were put to death. It's that kind of world in which Peter is writing. It's a context of suffering. It's a context of a hostility to the gospel. Here's the way I would summarize our context. It's not a hostility to the gospel that's around us, but rather it's a hardness to the gospel and a happiness without the gospel. That's our day. This is not a place of hostility, but this is a country that's increasingly becoming post-Christian. We have RDU filled with, like much of America, unchurched people and de-churched people. Unchurched people simply means they have never went to church. They, they grew up without the church. De-church, which I think there may be more of this in our area, are those who were fringe churchgoers at some time in the past, but no longer attend a church at all, and don't really even think about the church. Unchurch and de church, there is either a hardness to the gospel or a I'm happy without the gospel. Christianity in America is not in the center of culture, it's on the margins. And this is what we share in common with Peter's audience. Peter calls these Christians sojourners, strangers. They're pushed to the margins because of hostility. We're pushed to the mar margins because of a hardness to the gospel and a willingness to do life without it. Studies show that 85 million people in America today have no intention of attending a church service. In the UK, it's 40 million, which is 70% of the entire population. And all of these figures are higher among young people. In the States, the number of adults who do not attend a church service has nearly doubled since 1991. In 2010, one report uh, concluded that 3,500 churches in America close their doors every year. And attendance in more of the 80, 80 uh, uh, of, of those remaining are plateaued and declining. And so what you have, simply put, is a declining of the church. The Pew study reported that the rise of the religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, those with no religious affiliation, now account for 22% of our country. Consequently, we face challenges in sharing the gospel. And we shouldn't be surprised by biblical cluelessness today. And we should be prepared for mockery, ridicule, even legal rulings that may affect us. And so when it comes to evangelism, all this means is this. We can't leave evangelism to Sunday morning events. Nor can we reserve it for the trained clergy. Most unbelievers have no interest in showing up here on a Sunday. Simply offering a good product isn't enough. I mean, I love the movie Field of Dreams. 
It's that great line, if you build it, they will come. It's a great line. It's a terrible evangelism strategy because they won't. They simply won't. It doesn't matter how cool our venue is, how cool your pastor is, how great the music is, how good our coffee is. If we have Dominican donuts, it doesn't matter. Most unbelievers that I know don't wake up saying, you know, I thought, I've heard they got good coffee over there. I, I, thought, I, I heard the band's good. Now, the only unbelievers that show up are those who've been invited out there. They don't wake up thinking, let's see what's going on in there. You see, my friends, we must engage people in the marketplace. We must engage people in the workplace. We must engage people in our neighborhoods. We must engage them among our families, in our recreation places, in our networks. It does us no good to blame the lost for not showing up at our services. A farmer doesn't blame the crops for not growing when he hasn't first planted seeds. And it does no good to blame America for its drift towards secularism. And no president will fix the decline of the church in America. The solution for the decline of the church is not on Capitol Hill. It's the people of God being a city on a hill. This is what will change. Not partisan politics, not culture wars, not church gimmicks. The people of God living this text out. Who set apart Christ the Lord as holy. Who give people a reason for the hope that is within them. In other words, we have to be an everyday church with an everyday mission. And Peter tells us three important principles for doing that. First of all, practical goodness. How do you bear witness in a hard context? Notice what Peter says. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Notice the bookends of this section, verse 13 and 17, are about doing good. Verse 17 ends with, it's better to suffer for doing good. This is a big focus in Peter's book. Christians living lives of, of goodness, of beauty, of practicing good deeds. Over in chapter 2, verse 12, in the passage where Peter tells them that they're sojourners, he says this, keep your conduct among Gentiles or unbelievers in that context honorable. Keep your conduct honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Meaning that your good deeds will have such an impact on them, eventually they will come to embrace the gospel, and when Jesus comes, they will glorify him. Your good deeds may be used to win over unbelievers. Now, it, uh, witnessing involves more than just your lifestyle, but it definitely includes your lifestyle. And so he says here, let's be about goodness. If you're zealous for good deeds, that is, live in ardent pursuit of virtue, a virtuous life. And don't be surprised, he says in verses 13 and 14, that you may suffer for doing this. There's a possibility, he says, that you will suffer. Verse 13, now who is there to harm you for doing good? And you might think to yourself, well, why would anybody harm me for doing good? But that very thing happens, doesn't it? First John 3, uh, we're told that our love for one another may cause some to hate us which sounds very strange, but some, so sometimes your good deeds and your love may be used to, to win people over. Sometimes it may have the opposite effect. You may have a 1 Peter 2, 12 kind of thing where you win them over, or chapter 3, verse 1, where the unbelieving wife, by her goodness, wins over her husband. There may also be, though, the opposite effect. People may want to harm you for such a life. So Peter says, who is to harm you? Well, at one level, we would say, well, a lot of people might harm us. But Peter's talking in an ultimate sense. No one can harm you. Notice chapter 3, verse 12, right before verse 13. Actually, in Greek, it's the word and begins verse 13. It's linking the previous text. He says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. That is, God is aware of what's going on. He will have the last words. His ears are open to your prayers. He will vindicate his faithful on the last day. If God be for us, Paul says, who can be against us? And again, at one level, people might be against us. But that's only temporary. Ultimately, they won't prevail in a true and eternal sense because God is on our side. It's Psalm 56 as David was running from enemies. And he says, what can man do to me? In God whose word I praise, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Well, man can do a whole lot. 
but not ultimately. As he says on down in that psalm, this I know that God is for me. We want to be about good deeds. We want to be unsurprised by some level of opposition. You notice he says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. There's all kinds of suffering in the Bible, various categories of suffering. Here it's for doing God's will. Is suffering for righteousness sake. This is an echo of the beatitude where Jesus says, blessed are the persecutors. Now, in what ways are we blessed? It may not be material blessing, right? In fact, it most certainly probably will not be material blessing. This is a rich word that means happy or fulfilled or satisfied. You will enjoy the favor of God if you are doing God's will, if you're practicing righteousness and you suffer because of it, you will be blessed. That is, you will have the smile of God on your life, and there's nothing like that. In the great uh, book, The Lord of the Rings, in one place, Faramir has an opportunity to take the ring, and he doesn't, and Sam commends him for his character, and Faramir has a great line. He says, the praise of the praiseworthy is better than all rewards. The praise of the praiseworthy, that is our God. His praise, not that he praises us like we praise him, but rather the the accolade of God, the smile of God, the pleasure of God toward us is better than all reward. It's better than the praise of people. Why do we want to to do good even if we would suffer for righteousness' sake? The praise of the praiseworthy is better than all rewards. So my friends, live a life of practical goodness. In your neighborhood, in your school, in your workplace, be a good employee. Someone was commenting last, uh, on last week's sermon about the need to first be a good employee to be a good witness at work. And they said, we could give you a list of what not to do to be an effective witness at work because we've seen it uh, over and over, sadly. Well, let's be devoted to a life of virtue. Let's live to bless people. You know, there are a lot of Christians who know how to answer questions like, What must I do to be saved? But many don't know how to start these conversations. How do you begin the conversation? Well, here's a good first step. You live an attractive life under the lordship of Jesus that provokes questions. We provoke questions by practicing good deeds. Not always, but they will come. And as we're living an attractive life under his lordship, we have an opportunity to address them. To his lordship, we now turn from practical goodness, principle number two, on how to be a good witness in a hard context, Christ-centered reverence. Now we really get to the heart of the issue as he says, have no fear of them, that is the persecutors, those who oppose you, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. So if you suffer for for doing good, he says, don't fear people. And isn't this one of our, our biggest obstacles? to bearing witness to Jesus, the fear of man. We want people's approval, their acceptance. Proverbs 29, 25 says that the fear of man lays a snare. That is to say, the fear of man enslaves you. It traps you. It confines your thoughts and your actions and your words. It can keep you from bearing witness, fearing man. So how do you get over this fear of man? Do you do a karate kid, you know? Fear does not exist in this dojo, does it? No. No, sensei. You know, they were to overcome their fear with with training and with, as our coach says, believing in themselves. The way we overcome our fear of man in this text is a greater fear that is a fear of the Lord. He says, don't fear them, but set in your hearts Christ the Lord as holy. There is a a reverence here of Jesus. This is is Jesus talking to his disciples in Luke chapter 12, and he says, I tell you, friends, do not fear those who can kill the body, and after that have nothing more to do to you. But I warn you to whom you should fear. Fear him after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Fear him. It's amazing what would happen to our lives if we live with a reverential awe before Jesus. How small people would really seem how little their reaction would bother us. 
You see, we have misplaced fear. It's not a fear as a Christian that we have before Jesus that's one of terror, but rather one of awe, one of reverence. Set apart Christ the Lord as holy. Now, Peter is drawing this from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11 and following. And let me tell you what was happening in that context. The southern kingdom, Judah, faced threats from the northern kingdom that also had an ally, which is present-day Syria, and they were coming against King Ahaz in Judah. Ahaz is freaking out. He's scared to death. And Isaiah comes along, the prophet, and says, don't fear them. He actually says, don't fear what everybody else fears. And then he says in Isaiah 8, 13, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. He promises that God will preserve Judah in that battle. And Ahaz needs to redirect his, his, his concern. He needs to think more on the greatness of God than the greatness of his enemy. And so that's a wonderful principle for us in witnessing, isn't it? It's the awe of Jesus that will make us a witness for Jesus. If the awe of people overtake our awe of Jesus, then we'll cave in to fear. We won't be faithful. We won't be effective. We need a greater view of the holiness of Jesus, who we should really stand in awe of. So Christ-centered reference. Thirdly, finally, daily ready, readiness. To be a faithful witness in a hard context, we need to practice goodness. We need Christ-centered reverence, and we need a, a daily readiness. Notice what he says next when he says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone. Two important words there, always and anyone. When should we be ready to give a defense? Always. To whom? Anyone. Now, one of our problems, I think, if I could confess my own failure here, is that we're often wanting to find a perfect opportunity to bear witness. And uh, as I've thought more about it this week and thought about this text and other texts, you just come to the conclusion there's really not a perfect day to do evangelism. You can always find an excuse, can't you? Well, you know, I didn't sleep well. Well, that pretty much rules every day out. (laughs) Or I got in a fight with my kids. Or my spouse. Well, that rules some days out as well, doesn't it? This pollen is killing me. I can't bear witness. You know? Every day evangelism says, game on. Whether I'm in the best frame of mind or not, always and to anyone. And to remember, we're not commending ourselves. We're commending another. So be ready. In baseball, you know, I, I, I coach uh, 13 and 14-year-olds. I'm yelling regularly in the game. Hey, get in a ready position, will you? Like, this is not ready. This is not ready. You know, looking at the flowers is not ready. Had a kid get picked off first base because he's looking at the airplane that goes by. (laughs) And (laughs) will you get your head in the game, okay? Baseball, 90% mental, as they say, and the other 10 is 10% in your head. Um, You've got to stay focused. Well, we need to realize that the game is on. We need to to be ready. And Peter tells us in our readiness, here's our subject, here's our tone, and here's our goal. What is our subject for always and anyone? Notice, I love this, it's hope. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. Now, when he says defense here, this is uh, the Greek word apologia, where we get apologetics from. That may be a new word for some of you. Apologetics doesn't mean that we're apologizing for God. It means we're, we're making a reasoned defense for the faith. And while at one level, this verse does demand a level of study and preparation, after all, he uses the word reason. You need to be able to logically, um, you know, string some thoughts together. But you... But people kind of over, overkill apologetics on this verse in my mind, and they push it farther than, than Peter is, is, is going. Peter doesn't have in mind here, he does not have in mind formal academic apologetics here. He doesn't have in mind you being able to give sophisticated answers for the existence of God or answering the questions about the problem of evil or so on. 
No, you should not say, believer, in your heart, well, since I haven't had sufficient courses in apologetics, I can't be an effective witness. I haven't read Wittgenstein. I don't know who Van Til is, so I better keep my mouth shut. That's not the point here. Peter has hope in mind, not lofty arguments. He has ordinary conversation in mind, not public debate. He has conversations that happen on a street or maybe perhaps over your fence to your neighbor, in a car, in a hospital. You see, every Christian should say, I'm in. I can participate because every Christian has hope. Every Christian can say, I don't know, I was blind, but now I see. Every Christian can say, the best is still yet to come. The person who is on the hospital bed can lie there in hope as we await seeing the glory of Jesus. That can have a profound effect on people. You see, we're not being told in this verse to argue for the faith. You notice he doesn't say the faith, but to defend our hope. Now, it's a good thing to be ready to do that, for sure. But what Peter has in mind here is something more general. It's something that every believer can enjoy. And hope in the New Testament is not wishful thinking. It's not, I hope the Pelicans win the NBA. That's wishful thinking. They're probably not going to do it, though I'll be cheering them on. No, our hope in the New Testament is assured. The new heavens, the new earth, a new body, no tears, no more pain, an inheritance, final vindication, seeing Jesus Christ. That's a certainty for the saint. And we radiate with this kind of hope. As I've said before, hope in the New Testament is not fingers crossed. It's thumbs up. It's going to happen. And our hope in the future energizes our lives now. And our hope energizes our evangelism. And you see, friends, in the context of suffering, the believer's hope shines. And this hope is what separates us from unbelievers. And it gets their attention. This verse is actually liberating, not limiting. It's not limiting witnessing to the educated who know all the the theological words. It's liberating because every Christian has hope. If this is at a, about apologetics at all, we would call it the apologetics of hope. It's not so much about argumentation, it's about adoration. You see, to be an effective witness, you need more than a syllogism on paper. You need a song in your heart. That's what it takes to be a good witness. You adore Jesus. You radiate with hope. And every believer can do this. Grandma with no formal theological training can radiate with contagious Christian hope. Now, unbelievers is very important because they may not understand our theology, but they can identify hope. They can see hope. They will ask about hope. Therefore, I think the application of this verse is quite simple, believer. Get hopeful. Get hopeful every day. Every day you go back to the gospel and remind yourself of all that Christ has done for you and all that Christ has for you. And you preach the gospel to your own soul. It's this hope that not only sustains us in suffering, but it's this hope that shines in suffering. This is what makes us a city on a hill. When life hurts, when dreams fade, we can still abound in hope because of who Christ is and what he has done. When you are diagnosed with a terminal illness and you radiate with this kind of hope, it may have a tremendous impact on those around you. And we know that happens because we can all give testimony of that happening. That's our subject in this passage. It's hope. Now, what is our tone? As we convey this hope, Peter says, yet do it with gentleness. Apparently, Peter knows that Christians have a tendency to not do it with gentleness and respect. And we should be reminded that it's Peter himself who's writing this, who was not previously known for gentleness. This is the guy, if you don't know, who cut a guy's ear off with a sword. Okay? (laughs) And now he's saying, I need to be gentle, guys. I need to be gentle. He's like, always packing. And now he's saying... And we're going to give a reason for our hope, but we need to be gentle, not haughty, not ugly and defensive, but humble, 
respectful, and gentle. We looked at this last week when we talked about being winsome and gracious, didn't we? And you see, that's what the gospel does. The gospel makes us gentle. And this is why we can proclaim Christ in a Christly manner. It's Jesus who was the gentle Savior. The gospel makes us warm. The gospel makes us patient. The gospel makes us approachable. The gospel keeps us from looking to get our fulfillment uh, from people, our acceptance from people. The gospel makes us secure. We were talking to Ben Palka last week, one of our church planters, and he was talking about how he spends so much time in these discussion Bible studies that they've created for unbelievers and how he's basically had to re-engineer his schedule because in D.C. you can't find anybody from 8 to 5, and then they fill the city. And Ben is up till midnight, 1 o'clock, with others in his team, and they just print out a set of questions each week. Some weeks on the Holy Spirit, one week's just on the, the Bible, and uh, they befriended people in the city, and they're just going into restaurants, they're going into their homes, and they're just having discussions about theology. And Ben said, it's remarkable how these professional people can be so intelligent and so good at their jobs, but have such a little understanding of anything in the Bible. And so they're just asking Ben the most basic of questions. In fact, they can't really understand that you can actually start a church. One guy, Ben said, couldn't get it in his head. That, that Ben says, you know, every church you see actually started sometime. He said, oh, wow, 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 yeah, I guess that's right. And um, so they're getting asked these questions. Ben says they don't have much respect for us, but then they do have respect for us. They can kind of consider us one step above a yoga instructor, he said, and, uh, and, and one step below a life coach, I think is the phrase he used. No, no disrespect to yoga instructors here or life coaches, but, but he was just trying to explain how they don't have a category for church planter. And if he runs around saying, I work for the Baptist, that confuses him even more. And so... Uh, <laughs> He get, he's getting invited in these studies, but they do respect him because they know as he starts talking, he kind of knows what he's talking about. And it's important when you're addressing unbelievers when it comes to your tone. In fact, one of the things that Ben communicated was how they speak more about he and Wesley's tone than their answers because that's not been their experience. We do this with gentleness. And we need to be reminded that gentleness is persuasive. The proverb puts it like this, the gentle tongue breaks the bone. That's so counterintuitive. How do you deal with hardness of heart? It's by gentleness. That breaks the bone. You know, Jesus reserved his softest, most gracious words for sinners. He goes to the woman at the well and says, can I have a drink of water? His harshest words were for the religious. With the unbeliever, He was amazingly gentle. And he, my friends, was gentle with us. D.A. Carson tells a story of a medical doctor who was serving in a Muslim country. And a woman came in with her son. son, Her son had a real nasty fall, had a big gash in his leg. And the doctor was explaining how important it was to clean the wound up before sewing it up. And the woman then suddenly offered this thought. She said, quote, sometimes I wish I could clean up my dirty heart. Well, what do you what do you say in that moment? Well, you don't say this. Well, you see, ma'am, the problem is you're a Muslim. We Christians have an atonement theory. We know what to do with dirt. But while you believe in the sovereignty of God and the holiness of God, you don't have a way with for, for dealing with dirt adequately now, do you? I'm not surprised that you feel the way you do. That is not the right way to respond. You may win an argument. But you have lost a person. This is what the doctor said. The wise doctor said, I know exactly what you mean, ma'am. My heart was so dirty until someone came and cleaned it up. Just like I'm doing with your son's leg. Can I tell you how he did it? Isn't that better? Isn't that more hopeful? More gentle? Won't that provoke more questions? We must preach Christ in a Christly manner. And then our goal. What is our goal in our sharing of this hope? I would simply summarize it as faithfulness. Peter actually puts the the goal here on the one witnessing. Do these things, he says, so that you can have a good conscience. You. 
your conscience is clear. Unbelievers may not respond to you. But what, what do we do? Well, we're faithful, and we leave the results to God, don't we? We know it's God ultimately who converts, not us. Our God works through means. He works through faithful evangelism to bring people to faith. But ultimately, our job is to be faithful. And he says, when you're slandered, assuming that some of you will, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, which is an end times idea that ultimately God will vindicate his people and those who have lived a life of rebellion to Christ will eventually be put to shame. You don't have to shame them. I'll have the last word. Reserve judgment for God. Same idea is conveyed in verse 17. It is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. It's better to suffer now in this life for being a faithful witness than to suffer forever for rejecting God and His grace. As we often say around here that for the Christian, this life is as hard as it's ever going to be. We, there's a little suffering along the way. Sometimes some horrendous suffering along the way. It's not an easy life, but we have an eternal perspective, don't we? It's better to suffer now than to suffer later. That's a good word for those of you who are not believers. to Think about that. What's the gospel about? It's about removing suffering, eternal suffering. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean you don't suffer in this life. You will. But one day there will be no more suffering. That's the hope that we have, isn't it? Therefore, let's pursue faithfulness. That's the call as a Christian witness. And after all, isn't this the path of Jesus? He suffered for doing God's will. No one suffered more unjustly than our Lord. You see, this idea lies at the very heart of the gospel and at the very heart of Christian ethics. We don't live for the glory of God because it will necessarily be easy. We do it because that's the call. Notice verse 18, if you just peek into the next verse. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. He's righteous. He suffered for the unrighteous. Why? That he might bring us to God. That's the suffering. The suffering of Jesus taking our place on the cross. That offers up to us the forgiveness of sins, new life, and the promise of future glory. Yes, in many ways, this whole text is about emulating the witness of Jesus. It's Jesus who went about doing good, who suffered for doing God's will, who suffered in view of future glory, radiating with hope. It's Jesus who is the model of gentleness, who comes to everyone and says, if you're weary or heavy burdened, come to me, I will give you rest. It's through our faith in Jesus that we become new creations by the power of the Holy Spirit that we shine as lights in this dark world. And so I pray that God today would increase our love for the Savior and that of the overflow of our hearts, we would bear witness to him as we go about pursuing goodness, as we revere Jesus and not fearing man, and as we get hopeful every day, ready to share our hope with those that we encounter. May God grant us grace to do these things. Let's pray together. Father, as we approach the table now, we are reminded of the sufferings of Jesus, the glorious salvation that we enjoy, and the future glory that is ours. So as we approach this table, a time of holiness and a time of hope, I pray that you would center our gaze upon the Christ, increasing our love for him. In his name we pray. Amen.